Welcome to our lesson that will discuss Chapter 4, Chemical, chemical Quantities and Aqueous Solutions from our chemistry book written by Tro. Chemical quantities, of course, is uh, a little application of our mole map from a previous lesson. Looking at a balanced equation in terms of a, a, a recipe, stoichiometry will be our title. Stoichiometry and how it applies to quantities from a balanced reaction and is applied in aqueous solutions. Some of the tool pages that we have used in our prior lesson looked a lot like this. It was our mole map, where we learned that the central calculation of all of chemistry here is the mole unit. The ways that we measure matter, we can count it by individual particles, we can weigh it using the mass here on a scale, or we can take a volume by heading north up to the balloon. We can count it, we can weigh it, we can take a volume. The central calculation known as the mole has allowed us to interconvert the way that we measure matter. By counting, we know how much a substance weighs. By weighing, we would know how large a volume of gas is at standard conditions. By counting, weighing, or taking a volume, they all interconvert back to the most important unit known as the chemical mole. In our next journey here in chapter 10, no, excuse me, in our journey of chapter 4 for the Tro book, we are going to take a look at the stoichiometry roadmap and see how that applies indeed to our original mole map. We can count particles, see how these are individual particles that we can count. We can weigh matter and get a mass in grams, or we can take the volume measured in a liter for volumes of gases at STP. These individual particles, by weight, by volume, or by counting, all lead back into the central calculation known as the mole. In a given quantity, we always convert into our unit known as the mole. Our balanced chemical equation will give us those ratios in the center, and then we know how to convert back into either counting, weighing, or taking a volume. You should spend a minute, pause the video, and spend a minute relating how is this original mole map similar to the new stoichiometry road map? What are its similarities and what are its differences? You've printed off our copy of the uh, notepad for our stoichiometry journey. This will be the beginning of a lesson that is just going to remind us what is stoichiometry and how do we go about reading um, in terms of balanced equations is nothing more than recipe cards. So if I just consider equations as recipe, it will tell the chemist exactly how much of each ingredient we need to mix for the amount of products to express. Stoichiometry is simply the quantitative study of a chemical reaction. the quantitative study of a chemical reaction. In other words, it's reading a recipe card. How many of each ingredient do we need to produce a desired amount of product? If we examine a, a first example, let's take a look at the production of ammonia from its elements. The balanced equation would represent a combination or a synthesis reaction where molecular nitrogen, written as N2, combines with molecular hydrogen, written as H2, forming molecular ammonia, NH3. Ammonia, hydrogen, and nitrogen all are in the gaseous phase at room temperature. To balance our equation, we will need to balance the ends first, making us double the product side giving us a total of six H's on the left and right. Our ratio of one to three to two balances those equations here. But really what we're trying to do in the first step of our stoichiometry journey is to make sense, what do these numbers actually mean? A one to three to two ratio, those coefficients, what do they stand for? How do we interpret this balanced equation as you would if you were reading a recipe? What does this number one stand for? Or about the three or the two? Well, they stand for each position that we talked about on our chemical mole map. 
Those coefficients we've learned stand for the way that we interpret equations. They can stand for the number of interacting particles. I can read a balanced equation and tell you how many particles are interacting. I can tell you how many moles are interacting. I can tell you the weight of each reactant, and if indeed all the reactants were gases, we can talk about the volumes of interacting gases. So when I consider looking at a balanced recipe card as nothing more than reading through for how many of each to produce a desired quantity, let's listen to this first sentence in terms of interacting particles. We have one molecule of molecular nitrogen reacting with three molecules, let me just abbreviate molecule there, of molecular hydrogen forming two molecules of ammonia. Coefficients can stand directly for the number of interacting molecules. One molecule of N2 plus three molecules of H2 will form two molecules of NH3. The individual particle is the direct interpretation for coefficients, but most impractical we can't really measure out a single molecule of nitrogen or three molecules of hydrogen. They're just indeed too small. So we can also interpret this instead of from a microscopic, we can interpret it in a macroscopic way. That coefficients can indeed stand directly for the number of interacting moles. One mole of molecular nitrogen reacts with three moles of molecular hydrogen to form two moles of ammonia. Indeed, one of the most important ways to interpret a balanced equation is in terms of interacting moles. Coefficients can stand directly for the number of interacting particles. They can stand directly for the number of interacting moles, but we have to interpret grams a little bit differently because see atoms just weigh different amounts depending upon their formula weights from the periodic table. One molecule of nitrogen does not have the same mass as three molecules of hydrogen. Those atoms weigh different. Now if you review, if I'm at the number of moles and I want to know how many grams that substance weighs, we know indeed that the conversion is called the molar mass the weight of the substance off the periodic table, the sum of the atomic weights. So you will indeed need to pull out your periodic table and begin looking up these weights with me when I want to interpret in terms of a balanced equation, in terms of interacting grams. It is not, not okay to say one gram of nitrogen plus three grams of hydrogen. It does not work that way. Instead, we have to use the molar mass. Now look on your periodic table. See how the molar mass of nitrogen is 14? If I have two atoms of nitrogen and one mole of that coefficient here, one times the molar mass, we'd have 28 grams of nitrogen. Two nitrogens, each weighing 14, gives me the sum of 28 times the number of moles, and kind of make sense of that with me here, one mole of nitrogen times the molar mass of 28 grams, we have 28 grams of nitrogen sitting on that scale. So our first reactant has a mass of 28 grams. Look on your periodic table. Do you find the formula weight there for hydrogen? It's atomic weight of one. But I see in the formula that we have two hydrogens hooked together. So its total mass is two. Two units, each contributing one, will add to a two. Okay, But now I have three moles of that substance. Recall, if you have three moles, three times the molar mass, three times two grams per mole for hydrogen is going to weigh six grams. So here we have six grams of molecular hydrogen. Remember, mole times molar mass is all I'm really doing. And the molar mass is just adding the weights off the chart. The number of moles is indeed coming right from the coefficient. Three moles of hydrogen times its molar mass of two gives me a total of six grams of our, of our reactant hydrogen. 
Here we have a molecular ammonia. Nitrogen weighs 14. Hydrogen weighs 1, but I'm seeing a total of 3 in that formula. Summing their formula weight, I get 17 grams. Think about the mole map as we interpret that equation. The coefficient was 2. 2 times the molar mass of 17 travels the road between moles and mass. 2 times 17 indeed gives us a total of 34 grams of ammonia. Very important, something to notice. The sum of the reactants in grams equals the sum of the product in grams. The number of grams is always conserved. What's conserved is known as the law of conservation of mass. Because we have the same number of atoms, and that's true because we balanced an equation. All balanced equations have the same number of each element's atoms on both sides, therefore conserving the mass. This is known as the law of conservation of mass. We have one more way to interpret the equation if indeed all of the reactants and products are gases. And if I go from the central unit of the mole up to the balloon where we measure standard conditions for molar volumes of gases, we've learned that the conversion factor is 22.4 liters. One mole of any gas at standard conditions will occupy a volume of 22.4 liters. So considering that particular interpretation for volumes, one mole of nitrogen would be 22.4 liters big. Moles, our coefficient, times 22.4, our molar volume. So the mole times molar volume, which is a constant, 22.4. Remember, molar mass is very different for each element, but molar volume is a constant, 22.4, any gas will occupy a volume at standard conditions of 22.4 liters. So 1 times 22.4 got us the volume for nitrogen. 3 times 22.4 is 67.2. I had to hit that. 67.2 liters of hydrogen, giving us a total volume of 2 times 22.4, or 44.8 liters. Notice, this upsets some students at first, there is no such thing as the law of conservation of volume. That's okay. There is no such thing as the law of conservation of moles. That's okay. No law that says interacting molecules must be the same on both sides. One plus three does not equal two. But there is indeed a law that says the mass must be conserved. They must be the same on both sides. The weights of the reactants indeed will always equal the weights of the product. Let's try another. Let's take a look at equation for combustion of liquid ethanol, a combustion pattern. The reactant called ethanol is C2, it didn't print very well but your um, notepad should have that clear, C2H5O8. Combustion of the ethanol adds oxygen and produces carbon dioxide and water. And there is a great deal amount of heat, so we can assume indeed that these are, this guy is a liquid, told to us in the story problem, a liquid. Oxygen is in the gaseous form. Carbon dioxide would come out as a gas. Water would come out as a gas at that extreme temperature. But as soon as I read that one of the reactants or product for that matter, but here's the reactant, is in the liquid form, we will not be able to read this in terms of volume. Volume, the fourth interpretation, is only good for all gases, for reactants and products. But we can read this in terms of interacting molecules. It simply would, oh, I didn't balance yet, two carbons, two carbons, six H's, six H's, let's see what we have now. Four plus three is a total of seven oxygens. I have one here, so I need six more. There, I got it. 
3 plus 3 times 2 is 6, plus 1 more there gives me the 7 that balances the oxygens. So the stoichiometric ratio, a 1 to 3 to 2 to 3. If you don't like that word, call it mole ratios, a 1 to 3 to 2 to 3 mole ratio. We can clearly see that one molecule of liquid ethanol combusts with three molecules of molecular oxygen to form two molecules of carbon dioxide and three molecules of water. We could also read those coefficients directly in terms of interacting moles. One mole of ethanol will react with three moles of oxygen, forming two moles of carbon dioxide and three moles of water. Now I believe you'll turn your page to the next page to fill this out, but I think I'll just extend my page so I can see the balanced equation, and we'll do this in terms of interacting mass. We have a little mole map work to do. We have to interpret these in terms of grams. Remember, to find grams, the mass, it's a calculation. Mole times molar mass for each individual component of our reaction. The number of moles, of course, comes from the coefficient, and the molar mass is simply found by summing each individual component's formula weight. So carbon, for instance, atomic weight of 12, but I see two of those in the formula. Hydrogen has an atomic weight of 1, and I see a total of 6 in that formula. And oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, and I see just 1. Let's sum the formula weight, known as the molar mass, of liquid ethanol. 12 times 2 plus 6 plus 16 and I have 46. So this first reactant, 46 grams of ethanol reacts with, and now here is my next reactant. We have oxygen. So we did, first of all, we did the ethanol. Now let's add up 3 moles worth of oxygen. Alrighty, so again, we need the molar mass. Oxygen has a weight of 16, but molecular oxygen then, of course, has 2. So the total weight there is 32. We have 3 moles worth. 3 times 32 is 96 grams. That's going to yield 2 moles worth of carbon dioxide. Alrighty, so carbon with its atomic weight of 12. Oxygen's atomic weight is 16, but that formula contains two of them. So when I sum 12 and 32, we get a total weight of 44 grams for carbon dioxide. Oops, I'm sorry. 44 would be the weight of one mole, but I caught myself that error there. I have two moles worth, so I have to say 44 times 2. All right, so let me repair that here. We end up with a total of 88 grams of CO2. And then one more product to sum, we have some water. Water, of course, uh, we have two H's at one apiece, plus 16 on the oxygen, its molar mass of 18. But notice the coefficient of 3. So 3 times 18 gives me a mass of 54 grams. So let's just do a little mental math here. Let's add to make sure we have indeed come up with the right quantities because I know there is something called the law of conservation of mass. It's a nice way to just quickly check did we make any kind of math errors. So the sum of 46 and 96, I get the weight of 142. And 88 plus 54, I get the weight of 142. So indeed, we have shown the law of conservation of mass. We also are being asked to interpret for uh, in terms of volume, but again, it can't be done because one of the reactants was a liquid. So the methanol, or excuse me, ethanol, C2H5OH, was in liquid form, therefore voiding out that fourth interpretation.
So these coefficients stand for stuff. They stand for the ways that we measure matter. If indeed I take potassium and drop it into water, and I like to write water as H OH instead of H2O, I can see the constituent ions in molecular water. I like to do that for both my singles and my double replacement reactions. That way I can see in this single displacement, potassium is going to kick out hydrogen and molecular hydrogen does indeed form. But the second product, the compound that forms, is potassium hydroxide, KOH, based on charge. Then we go back and we balance. Two H's in molecular hydrogen, I better put two H's. That gives me two OH's. And then I come back and repair the K's. A stoichiometric ratio of two to two to one to two. Two to one two is a mole ratio. It's a stoichiometric ratio giving meaning to our coefficients. Now here's an example where we have some other adjectives for the types of particles. So far we've just been having molecules. But I know that sometimes we count individual atoms. Sometimes we count formula units, which are the building blocks of ionic compounds. And sometimes we have to count molecules. And let's review a little bit of how do I select the proper vocabulary. Atoms, I know, are just simple symbols of the elements. And I see one right here, potassium, just a simple symbol. The elemental form of potassium is an atom. Formula units are those things built of ions. Typically, you see a metal hooked to a nonmetal. This is where we take a positive ion and we crisscross and find it with a negative ion. Whenever we crisscross, we make something known as a formula unit. And the last one, of course, the molecular compounds are when nonmetals bond together. So when nonmetals bond, we come up with molecules. This particular example allowed me to review the vocabulary so I can correctly select the right word in my first interpretation. See, this particle is a general term, a generic term to stand for those things that we count. Well, we count atoms, we count formula units, and we count molecules. This particular recipe, this balanced equation for the single displacement of potassium with water, will allow me to model each one of these terms. So let's go to work. It says two Ks. Well, that stands for two atoms of potassium. The elemental form of potassium are atoms plus. Here we have HOH, we commonly call water. I just wrote it in its ionic formula. But all of those ingredients indeed are non-metals, so that indeed is a molecule. Two molecules of water form. Two H's hooked together, the elemental form of hydrogen is indeed a molecule. Two non-metals bonded give us a molecule. And there's one of those. And here's a compound where I hooked a positive to a negative, a cation to an anion. We crisscross to make this formula. It indeed is known as a formula unit. We have two formula units of potassium hydroxide. Two atoms of potassium react with two molecules of water to form one molecule of hydrogen and two formula units of potassium hydroxide our word bank for selecting correct vocabulary words for interacting particles. We've also learned that coefficients stand directly for the interacting moles. Two moles of potassium react with two moles of water, forming two moles of hydrogen. I'm sorry, I can read a balanced equation, I bet you. That coefficient is actually a one. <laughs> one mole of hydrogen and two moles of potassium hydroxide. So coefficients standing directly for the atoms and directly for the interacting moles. We have some mole map work to do for the interacting mass. Remember it is not okay to say two grams plus two grams make one gram and two grams. It doesn't work that way. We have to do some mole map work. Recall that mass is equal to the number of moles times molar mass. Right off of our old mole map chart. So the molar mass, adding the weights of the, off the periodic table, 
times the coefficients which are standing directly for the moles. So let's find on our periodic table the molar mass of potassium. Two moles times the molar mass of 39 is 78 grams. Plus Molar mass of water is 18. 2 H is added to an O gives me 18. 2 moles times that molar mass of 18, and I'm finding 36 grams of water. 1 mole of molecular hydrogen would weigh 2 grams, its molar mass. K is 39. Oxygen is 16. Hydrogen weighs 1. So its molar mass is 56, but I have two moles of that. 56 times 2 is 112. So here we have 112 grams of KOH, potassium hydroxide. Double check your math. Is 78 plus 36 the same as 2 plus 112? Indeed it is. We have obeyed the law of conservation of mass. Just a good double check. And again, this is not allowed. Potassium we know is a solid at room temperature. Water would be a liquid. This is a gas. This ends up to be a solid. So not allowed simply as soon as I find one ingredient that's not in the gaseous form, I can eliminate the interpretation of volume. Pause your video here and practice the interpretation of balanced equations, very first steps in the journey called stoichiometry. And when you're comfortable with this lesson, let's start up with some calculations from our stoichiometry roadmap.